Dylan has arrived. Have you arrived? Come here. Good boy. Look, Dylan has arrived. That's what everyone wants to see. I know who's the true star of my channel, don't I? Yes. Mmm, lovely corgi breath. Yeah? Like the breath of fairies? Are you cute? Are you gonna go get in trouble and chew things? I had a box near the trash the other day, and I was sitting on the couch, and in comes Dylan with a box like twice his size, and he proceeds to shred it, so thank you for recycling, Dylan. Okay, well, you done? Okay, go play. Go play. Oh, he went through the tripod. Normally he's terrified of it. I feel like we have made progress today. Good job, Dylan. Good boy. You want to sit with ma'am while she reviews books? I don't know, guys. Okay. Hi, my name is Kendra Winchester. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about some books that I've wanted to talk to you about for a while. Or should I say a topic I've wanted to talk to you about for a while, but I don't really know where to start. So these are going to be some chatty reviews about books that are all set in the region of Appalachia. Now, if you're not familiar with Appalachia, or maybe you're not even from the United States, this is the region of Appalachia. It extends from New York State all the way down to Alabama. But central Appalachia is obviously West Virginia, and that is the only state that has all of its counties within the Appalachian region according to the Appalachia Regional Commission. That is a mouthful. But that is still 420 counties over 13 states, 14 states, somewhere around there. And that is actually a huge, huge region. And there's over 20 to 25 million people within the region of Appalachia. So I left where I grew up, which was in the Ohio, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, tri-state region about 10 years ago to leave for college, and so I came down south. If you have heard anything about Appalachia, you've probably heard about this book, J.D. Vance's Hillbillyology. Now, I will admit, when I first read this book, I was so happy, thank you, Dylan, I was so happy for any type of representation of Appalachia. At the time, I had just started researching Appalachia, and the way that J.D. Vance talks about feeling out of place and not knowing things and having people talk about where you came from like they're all hillbillies and they're all white trash and the negative jokes that people say about your region is just really exhausting and JD Vance talks about that and you can tell he's lost his accent he says Appalachia now which I feel is a sign um, because ultimately though reading about this book and reading more reviews about this book I am slowly more appalled that he makes some very generalized or generalizations about an entire region based on his own family experiences and he also cites some uh, people that uh, white supremacists cite for their own benefit and different things but I've got to be honest and say I have not been able to articulate all of my feelings about this book and why I dislike it so much in in any really tangible way but recently I actually finally picked up a copy of What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia. Now, we interviewed Elizabeth Catt, the author of this book, on our podcast, Reading Women, and I will link that above my head, and you can go check that out. But this book, I feel like, did a much better job of covering the region of Appalachia. Now, you might have noticed since the 2016 election, there have been a lot of Trump country pieces written about Appalachia, and it's where these people from urban centers, whether they're conservative or liberal, uh, they like parachute in and they spend five days there and they're like, I understand Appalachia now and blah blah blah. They don't really at all and they're just looking at one region of Appalachia or they'll spin a story a certain way and I find that very frustrating. But again, I just felt like I did not have enough information or a way to articulate how I felt about those things or explain to people why I felt so frustrated and insulted by many of these pieces. Uh, so for when I found this book, I feel like she does a great job of explaining why that is. And she does a great job of respecting other cultures as well within the community, as well as trying to expand people's perspective of what Appalachia means. Now, you probably have lots of questions, since, especially since I said I really dislike Hillbillyology, and I feel like that's a bit of a darling book right now. But I would highly recommend that you go check out this book, uh, this is from a Belt Publishing, and so you're also supporting Indie Press. You can find it uh, wherever you, you get your books. But it's only 150 pages. I literally almost underlined something on every page. I was afraid I would run out of little flags for the book. It's really amazing. And I could sit here and I could read quotes to you, but I would highly recommend that instead you go check out the interview that we did with Elizabeth Cat because I feel like she would give you a better primer of what's in this book. 
and why she has taken uh, to writing this response to Hillbilly Elegy and the way the media has been covering uh, Appalachia, especially since the 2016 election. Also, before I forget, in the back of this book is a resource list of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, documentaries, just all sorts of different media that you can go check out that she feels represents the Appalachian community and different parts of the Appalachian community. She now lives in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, but she grew up in Eastern Tennessee in Knoxville. So that's pretty cool. Autumn is also from Knoxville. So they had a great time chatting that after we ended the recording. <laughs> so another book set in the Shenandoah Valley and that Elizabeth Cat actually blurbed is Dope Sick by Beth Macy. And she, her blurb says, Dope Sick is both a tribute to those who lost and a fierce rebuke to those who took and the new guidebook for understanding this quintessentially American crisis. Now this is set in the Shenandoah Valley and I feel like I can't talk about this book about the opioid epidemic without talking about Dreamland by Sam Quinones. Now this is a book that came out in 2015 and I interviewed Sam Quinones for um, my hometown's paper because I am from Portsmouth, which is one of the towns that he profiles in this book. He profiles Portsmouth and Southern Ohio, as well as the town of Mexico, and he parallels black tar heroin's arrival to the United States with this town of Mexico and the opioid crisis and pill mills uh, starting in uh, Portsmouth area. This book, though, is more technical. It's an overall view of the opioid crisis, and I feel like I understood how opiates connect to black tar heroin on a down-to-earth scale so much better with Dreamland. However, his is a more overview book. He, he touches down and, and talks to some people, but we don't know exactly what happens to them per se. So what Beth Macy does, she takes a totally different tactic than Sam Quinones, and she follows people. So if you want something more technical and that's an overview, beautifully, gorgeously written, it definitely deserved that National Book, National book Critics Circle Award. There we go. It definitely deserved that award. But Beth Macy is all about people. It's more of an evicted kind of tact where she just follows certain people through their experiences and illustrates how devastating this crisis is to families and how dangerous it is to doctors now who are refusing to prescribe things and it's dangerous for people who are given wrong information and find themselves addicted to opioids and just how that changes your brain and just what it looks like on an everyday basis and I feel like she just does this so incredibly well. And I really and enjoyed that part of the book. I will say when it came to actually describing how the crisis began and how the two drugs connected to each other and people who were addicted to opioids then were addicted to heroin, I did not understand reading her book. But I understood because I'd already read Dreamland. So I would say Sam Quinones is better at the technical side of things and the overview of the crisis, while Beth Macy is more about people. So it depends on what kind of book you want to read. I prefer Dreamland, but you might prefer a book where she focuses on people and characters. So I feel like it's definitely a topic that people need to read about, but now you have more choices and you can decide what book you want to read for your own education. And both of these books are heavily cited, so you have more resources at the end. Also, Beth Macy's is newer, so she has more updated information. But I will say, as many of you have commented when I've talked about this opioid crisis, that uh, the laws in certain states are changing. And people who are now terminally ill cannot get opiates to ease their passing, and it's a problem. So she does talk about that updated information in here. So um, there you go. Go forth and read. So the last book I'm going to tell you about today is set in my home region. Now I have to say I've never read a book set in my home region besides dreamland and that's kind of well I should say I've never read fiction in my home region so I was so excited to finally read this book set in southern Ohio and that is The Summer That Melted Everything by Tiffany McDaniel. Now this book is a little different um this is a almost like a religious allegory only it's an atheist religious allegory complicated but by that I mean it's super heavy-handed in the way that it uses religious symbolism and to promote the atheist perspective that I'm assuming that the author has, but I guess we can never assume, but you know, I'm just gonna go and just go out on a limb there. And that's what I'm assuming her perspective is. You know, as a woman of faith who does love to study theology and spiritual topics within books, not also not just within Christianity, but in other religions as well, I found this very interesting because this is a tradition that is not really 
written in very much. Not only is this a crisis of faith kind of novel, but it's also that allegory element there. This book starts when Feeling is walking down the road and he's thinking how his dad has recently put an ad in the newspaper inviting the devil to town. It, long story, but that's what's happened. And so he meets a little black boy on the road, about the same age as him, and he say, holds up the ad from the newspaper and says, I'm the devil. And he's like, what? He's like, I am the devil and I have come to town. <laughs> this kid is really well spoken and it's just so smart. And so uh, Fielding begins to think maybe this, this kid is really the devil. So he's like, well, I'll take you to my dad. So they're walking to their dad, see his dad, and they meet a one of the neighbors. And one of the neighbors is a little person and his name is Elohim. Uh, and if you don't know, that's another name used for God. And uh, the Bible. And so you could see the heavy handed nature of the story. But she kind of goes for it. She just is like, okay, well, this is what I'm doing. So I'm just going to go there. Just go there, commit to it. And she does. So this book is really weird. It makes me think that this is kind of like an indie book. Like it's very strange, very different, very weird. And not everyone will like it because it is all of these things, but her writing style is just gorgeous. I really began to pay attention to this book and realized that I might just have a real gem on my hands when I saw this. Uh, it says at the beginning of chapter two, once I once heard someone refer to Brothed as the scar of the paradise we lost. So it was in many ways a place with a perfect wound just below the surface. It was a resting in the southern low of Ohio in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains where each porch had a small orchard of small talk and rocking chairs, where cigarette tongues flapped over glasses of lemonade. They said the wooded hills were the fence God himself built for us. Hills I always thought were the busiest hills in all the world, busy rising and rolling and surrounding. From Main Lane, the town unfurled into lanes of houses and eventually lanes of farms the farther out you got. Brethid was the combination of flower and weed, of the overgrown and the mowed. It was Appalachian country as only Southern Ohio can be. And it was beautiful as a sunbeam in waist high grass. So this stylistic writing, of course, is my kryptonite. And I, I just love it so much. Her writing is just so stellar. And it's set in 1984. So as a story about this orphan boy who shows up at this house and he is a local prosecutor. And in many ways, it's giving me like To Kill a Mockingbird vibes only about religion as opposed to race relations, though that is a heavy theme in the book, considering that it is a young African American boy. But there's also themes of bodily difference. There's just a lot going on. I will say, I think in some ways you can tell that it's a debut because she falls into some of the common traps of writing about certain topics. And I can't tell you what those are because those are spoilers. So this isn't perfect. And in fact, in many ways, it's a hot mess. But because it's so unique, her writing on a sentence level is so stellar. I felt like I really enjoyed this book. And if this is her debut, I feel like she's going to be able to tighten things up in the future and just write even better and better books. So I'm very much looking forward to her next novel. And since this came out in 2016, there's time for it. Like it should be coming like in the next, you know, few years, right? Because they write, I don't know how she writes. I don't want to put too much pressure on her. But it, it is really an interesting book. So if that's something that you like, you don't mind uh, heavy symbolism and you don't mind something a little weird, uh, something more focused on religious topics or different things, then this is something I think you'll definitely like. It's definitely in Kendra's wheelhouse. It has like almost all the check boxes for things that I want to read, like my kryptonite and my just a Kendra book. So I find that very interesting. Uh, also, by the way, public service announcement. If you're watching this around the time it came out, I saw this on Book Outlet today. So you should definitely go check it out because it's just so different. It's just so different. So I'd be interested to see what other people think about it because it might be a love or hate book depending on how you like your books. But I really enjoyed this one and we'll be keeping it and hopefully rereading it and making notes in it because it's just so interesting. So I hope to do more of these videos about books about Appalachia and why it's important to me that we have better representation in the media and not just representation about Appalachia but the different communities within Appalachia. As I said in the beginning of the video, we are not a monolith. There are people with different accents than I do. Autumn's from Knoxville. She's also from Appalachia but she has a totally different take on things so it's not like we're a singular perspective but I would like a more well-rounded perspective for people outside of the region. 
yeah, we definitely need more representation in so many areas, but this particular one is close to my heart, so I hope to be telling you more about it. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. All the things I've talked about will be linked down in the description box, and you can go check that out, and definitely go check out the interview with Elizabeth Cat. But until next time, I'll talk to you later, guys. Bye.